Hi, welcome back to Biology. My name is Mr. Kabuski. Uh, today we're going to continue on with Unit 7. We've been talking about reproduction. Uh, in the last unit we talked about, excuse me, last unit, last section, we talked about mitosis, uh, the cell cycle, and types of reproduction. We talked about asexual and sexual reproduction. Well, today we're going to focus a little bit more on sexual reproduction uh, and talk about how offspring are actually created. Now, the reason we're going to take time to do this is because, in theory, we've already done this with asexual reproduction when we talked about mitosis. Because asexual reproduction you pass all of your traits, all of your chromosomes, all of your DNA on to another cell or another offspring and it creates a clone. Uh, and that's basically, you know, like any type of asexual reproduction is that way. But sexual reproduction is a little bit different. But let's take a second here. Let's try to answer this question just in our heads together here. How are offspring created in sexual reproduction? <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So humans need 46 chromosomes, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so if I have 46 chromosomes and my wife has 46 chromosomes, when we put those two cells together, that makes 92 chromosomes. But that's not a human being. That's way too many to be a human being. So what has to happen to this number, or maybe to this number, in order to get down to the numbers that would work to make it a human being? Like, if each human needs 46, that means if I divide that in half, it's 23, 23. So I need 23 chromosomes from each parent, I put those together, and I would get a human being. So how do I get down to that 23 number? Well, you do that through a process called meiosis, which is what we're going to talk about today. Meiosis is a type of cell division that halves the number of chromosomes in a cell, and it's used to make gametes, which are sex cells. So we're going to take that number, so in humans it would be 46, and we're going to cut that in half down to 23. So you can actually see meiosis taking place in this one cell at the bottom, it's actually divided into two already, and then it's just divided once again into four. Uh, and that's basically what meiosis is. And we'll talk about the phases here in a second. So what's a gamete then? Well, a gamete is a sex cell. In humans, or in all animals really, that, we're talking about sperm and egg. Uh, well, actually, an egg is technically called an ovum. We'll talk more about that here later on in the unit, uh, later on in this section. Okay? But this is just animals uh, that are the sperm and egg. Like in other organisms, like in plants, you know, their male gamete is actually pollen. And so they don't have sperm cells, they have pollen, which is what they use to transfer uh, their male chromosomes to the female flower, which is how they fertilize those uh, plant cells, which is where the term fertilization comes from and fertilizing uh, and stuff like that. But we'll talk more about that later on. Okay, so gametes are what we call haploid. And what that means is they have one set of chromosomes. Now, normally in every cell of your body, and we call those cells that make up your body somatic cells, all of those are diploid. And yes, I know there's a typo here. Sorry about that. Okay, diploid means that I have two, remember di means two, two sets of chromosomes. I get one from mom and one from dad. Now, those come from the gametes, the sex cells, like the sperm here with 23. And I put those two gametes together to make a diploid cell, which has 46 chromosomes. Okay, so haploid, half the number of normal chromosomes. So in humans, 46 would be our diploid number. So 23 is our haploid number. Now, you'll notice I have an N and a 2N here. That's just the way that we represent it mathematically. Uh, I would say that this cell is an N cell. That just means haploid. Or if it's 2N, that means it's diploid. Okay, so what's the key idea here? Take a second before you go on, pause it here, come up with a key idea, try to link the terms together because what's important to me as we go through this section and really this whole unit, if there's a lot of vocabulary terms and I don't just want you to memorize it, more important to me is that you're able to link the words together. Like how does haploid, diploid, meiosis, and gamete, how does that all go together? So take a second to think about that and then come back and you'll see my answer. So my key idea here, if I was going to link all these together, would be meiosis is a type of cell division that's used to make haploid gametes. So you'll see I use meiosis, I use cell division, I use haploid, and I use gametes. So I try to use as many vocab words and key terms or phrases as I can in the sentence uh, of the key idea to try to link the ideas together. And again, that's going to be more important to me than just being able to say what a gamete is. So you understand that a gamete is haploid and it's made during meiosis. That's more important to me. Okay. So let's keep moving on. So let's keep talking about these gametes. Now, fertilization is when the two gametes actually fuse together. When sperm meets egg, okay, that's known as fertilization. When that happens, those two haploid cells, cells with half the number of chromosomes, come together and they make a full set. So they make a diploid zygote. What is a zygote, you ask? Well, a zygote is just a fertilized egg. Okay, it's the very first diploid cell that will grow through mitosis. Now remember, the cell itself doesn't get bigger, but the organism does by dividing and making more cells. So the zygote is that very first cell that will eventually become an embryo, blastocyst, and fetus, and baby, and so on. Okay, like there, that this picture right here would be of your zygote that has just 
gone through its first cell division to make the second cell. Okay, and there you go. That's your very first picture. Hi, Mom. Okay, so just a quick rundown. If I was going to tie this all together, okay, I have an adult goes through sexual maturity. It's ready to reproduce. So in its sex cells and its sexual organs, he makes his sex cells, his gametes. Gametes fuse during fertilization. They make a zygote, and the zygote grows to become an adult. So what's the key idea here? Pause it. See if you can come up with a key idea and then compare it to mine. There's no right or wrong answer here. Just come up with your own idea. Don't just use my information, okay? Try to think for yourself on this. My key idea, and again, you're just going to just find the way that it is, is that haploid gametes combine during fertilization to make a diploid zygote. Again, I'm trying to use as many vocabulary words as possible as I go. So, meiosis. What exactly is meiosis, or meiosis, you can pronounce it either way, okay? What are the phases? Like, what are the steps? Remember, in mitosis, we had our PMAT. Well, meiosis, believe it or not, it's actually pretty much the same thing. You're going to go through PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, the exact same way. I'm going to have my duplicated chromosomes that'll pair up. Then they meet in the middle during, meio or, excuse me, during metaphase. During anaphase, they split. And during telophase, I make two new cells. All of that is exactly the same. In fact, even down to the number of chromosomes. This is just like mitosis. Meiosis, however, is different because it's not one cell division, it's two cell divisions, okay? So we're actually going to do this all over again. We did one PMAT, now we're going to do a second one, a second prophase, a second metaphase, a second anaphase, and a second telophase. Now you'll notice I have parts in blue and in red here. The difference between the first PMAT and the second PMAT is that the first PMAT up here at the top, it means uh, that we're using duplicated chromosomes. So I'm going to have X's going in either direction. The duplicated chromosomes are going to move that way, okay? In the second PMAT, homologous chromosomes are going to separate. Okay, what that means is that my one from mom and my one from dad that code for, let's say, my hair color, okay, they're going to go into two different cells, two different sex cells. In my case, it would be sperm, and at females, it would be an egg. Okay? So that's the difference between PMAT1 and PMAT2. In fact, we call them different things. We call one meiosis1, one, and then again, meiosis1 is the exact same as mitosis. And then meiosis 2, which is the second cell division that halves the number of chromosomes, and we get four unique gametes that are haploid. Okay. So meiosis is actually different in males and females. Male meiosis is known as spermatogenesis. We start with one cell. We go through two cell divisions. We get four identically sized sperm cells that are each unique and haploid, meaning they have different chromosomes in each because of the way that the chromosomes separate. In females, they go through oogenesis in their sex organs, okay? And that means that they're going to create one ovum, this is another word for an egg, out of one cell, which is the one on the right here. So I start with my one cell. It goes through its first cell division. You'll notice one of these cells is larger than the other, and then it goes through the second cell division. But only one cell ever actually becomes a mature egg and be ready to be fertilized. The other three are become what's known as polar bodies, and they're just disintegrated and not used by uh, the, the body. They just get kind of broken down and reused for other things. So males make four from one. Females make one from one. Okay, And yes, females have a certain number of eggs throughout their entire life, and once they're used up, they're gone. Okay, And this is one of the reasons why. And actually, the reason why this happens is actually a, an advantage because what happens is this egg actually steals cytoplasm from these other three cells so that it ends up bigger and healthier and better protected uh, to hopefully create uh, a, a baby. Okay, so let's take that life cycle from earlier and let's just expand on it. So we've got our zygote now. He's diploid, which means it's 2N. Okay, it grows through mitosis to become an adult, which means it's sexually mature. It goes through meiosis, egg meets sperm, fertilization occurs, and the zygote is a new zygote is formed. And uh, the, the circle of life continues. I apologize. If you were in class with me, you heard me sing my Lion King circle of life song. You don't want any part of that right now. So <laughs> let's go on. So what's the key idea here? The key idea for me, and again, your answer is different than mine, and that is okay. But there's two PMATs in meiosis, which at the end makes four cells that are haploid. It might, you can include things about that, like them being unique. You can have included sper uh, spermatogenesis and oogenesis. Whatever you wanted to include in there is fine. Okay. So meiosis creates those four haploid gametes that are genetically different from the parent cell. Well, why are they genetically different? Why is each of us unique? Why is sexual reproduction so good at making us so different? There are three reasons. The first one's known as crossing over. And no, that's not what Kobe does nightly, okay? <laughs> crossing over occurs during prophase one and on the way to metaphase one, okay? And what happens is that these duplicated chromosomes, remember that means these X's, 
they're lined up next to each other. And they get so close that sometimes the X's actually will trade legs. Like if you look here at the bottom, we had a red X and a green X. They got so close that they actually switched pieces. And now the red X has a green leg and the green X has a red egg. Or red leg, excuse me. Okay, so all they've done is just switch sections of DNA. Well, that may have completely changed those genes, though, that they're switching around. Okay, so this creates some genetic diversity, and this might be a reason why you don't look exactly like your brother and sister or exactly like your parents. Okay, the second reason is independent assortment. You've got 23 pairs of chromosomes, and you're only going to give one of each of those pairs to your kids. Now, it doesn't matter which one of each one that you give. You could give all of the left ones and all of the right ones. You could give left one of half and the right ones for half. Or you could give left, right, left, 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 right, left, right, left, like a completely random uh, assortment which is actually pretty cool because there are literally 8 million different combinations to the 23 power that you can create just in your own uh, sperm or egg cells, and that's even before crossing over occurs. So independent assortment just means that we can randomly assort uh, those chromosomes. And then lastly, random mating. Okay, That doesn't mean that I don't know who that I'm mating with. Okay, Random mating means that you get to pick who your mate is based on their genetics. You're actually picking a mate based on your genes. You may think that you picked them because you were attracted to them and fell in love with them and so on and so forth. But the reason that you were attracted to them in the first place is because your mind was telling you that there's something about this person's genes, and I'm not talking about what they wear on their legs, but their, their genes, their DNA that you think would be good for your offspring that you want to pass on to them. Okay, that's one of the reasons that we're attracted to people. Now, yes, you do fall in love and there's emotions attached to it, but that initial attraction occurs because of your genes. And they're not necessarily just physical. It could be a mental thing, too. Like, you recognize that that person is smart. I mean, especially in the human population, intelligence is a very driving factor to how we choose our mates. So think about that. When, next time you have a crush on someone, you're actually just really falling in love with their genes. Okay? So just as a quick review... There's crossing over, and I'm going to talk over <laughs> the announcements over here. But we've got crossing over, independent assortment, and then random mating uh, was the last one. Okay, and there you go. There's your different possibilities. You can see, you know, it's the same one at the start, but they end up being different at the end. So it's just completely random. So what's the key idea here at the end? Well, individuals are unique because of crossing over, independent assortment, and random mating. Now, we're going to do this in class, uh, but here's a quick rundown of what you need to know, some things about what's different between mitosis and meiosis. You should know the different types of reproduction they represent. You should know the results of each of them. You should know how they're similar and different, okay? meaning like the organism, like the, the offspring, is it similar or different to the parent, and then the types of cells that it creates. Okay. Now, well, I know we covered a lot, and I would encourage you to go back and watch back over this again because I had to talk so fast, but there's a lot of information. But it's pretty really interesting. I know you're saying, oh, you're just saying it because you're a science teacher, but it's actually pretty interesting when you think about all the different combinations and about how you know you were one of 300 million sperm cells that actually finished the race and got to the egg. And if, you, if that one hadn't made it, it would have been a different one, and you'd be a completely different person than you are right now uh, and just because of that one different sperm cell. It's pretty incredible when you really think about it. But I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, if you want me to sing the Circle of Life song for you, I'll have to do that in another video. But if you have questions, please feel free to contact me at jkabuski at gocathedral.com. Visit the website, mrkabuski.wordpress.com, and follow me on Twitter at Coach Kabuski. Have a great day. I appreciate your time.